Hello, welcome back. This is week seven, lecture two, the Wittenberg Theology, Reform and Revolt. And this lecture follows very naturally, I think, from the past lecture, the previous lecture, where we left Luther uh, in the Wartburg, having been snatched away by Frederick the Wise. Um, but first, before I get into this lecture, um, I want to address something about the, the text analysis number two that's coming up um, after this week, uh, basically, or this week. Um, it focuses on Luther's address to the Christian nobility of the German nation. Uh, and what I would like you to do and to focus on is analyzing the text, which is, you know, this is nothing new. Um, that's what I talk about in the assignment itself and also in the guide to writing the text analyses that it's posted. Um, and then on that basis, answer the question. But you'll need also to take into account uh, the readings in uh, the assigned read readings in the Luther book, my Luther book, um, and also some of the other assigned texts, such as the 95 Theses and the, the Disputation Against Scholastic Theology. Um, because the question is asking you, to what extent um, can we say that the Reformation started in 1520? which is the argument I put forward in my Luther book. And it's based on then on Luther's um, address to the Christian nobility. Um, can you make that argument based on that text itself? Now, part of that would be comparing um, and contrasting, so, so, so to speak, let's say the tone or tenor between the address to the Christian nobility and, for example, the 95 Theses and the Disputation Against the Scholastic Theology, place in context of the assigned readings in my Luther book and um, with the lectures. So I hope that kind of helps clarify because it's really a question that gets at the core of our understanding of what the Reformation was and how it developed um, from that point onward. And one of the issues that we need to see, regardless of when we end up dating the beginning of the Reformation, so to speak. Um, and here, I'll, of course, keep in mind that there's, I make the distinction between the Reformation of the later Middle Ages and then Luther's Reformation. Um, and then we'll be talking about other patterns of Reformation as we go along. Um, and so it's not just one single concept, the Reformation, that covers everything. It is different types of Reformation, different forms of Reformation, different attempts or calls for Reformation. Um, you know, what, what was a, is the difference between Luther's address to the Christian nobility of the German nation and the Reformation of the Emperor Sigismund, for example? Those aspects were there. Or between, you know, Luther's uh, address to the Christian nobility and Jordan Quellenborg's exposition on the Lord's Prayer. Put that all into kind of context. I say, okay, looking at the, this different development, was Luther's uh, address to the Christian nobility a product of the Reformation of the later Middle Ages? Or is it a new departure? If so, how so? If not, why not? That's what it's looking at and what I, I want you to, 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 to kind of analyze and get at. And I hope that kind of helps because it's one of his three great treatises of 1520, which really unleashed then the attack uh, and the controversy on Rome and Consequently, the attempt uh, uh, by Rome to really say this is not simply um, a, a problem that we can ignore or dismiss as a, a, a squabble between monks. This is getting serious. That led then to the Deed of Worms and Luther being whisked off by Frederick to the Wartburg. And that brings us then to the uh, point of departure for this lecture. Because at the Wartburg, as I'll be talking a little bit, actually, in the second slide, uh, or the third slide, after this introductory part, um, Wittenberg was in confusion. And I'll be talking about a bit more about that and when they became aware uh, of Luther's whereabouts and those interactions, and then when did Luther ended up returning to Wittenberg. So I'll be talking about that shortly. But Luther was not alone. Um, in his efforts, so to speak. And so often we focus so exclusively on Luther, and I'm not trying to undermine his importance at all, but we don't look at the broader context. And that's why this lecture with the Wittenberg theology, Luther himself referred to it as that. It's our theology at Wittenberg is the theology of Augustine, and we're really bringing about something new. And part of that, too, was a figure 
that um, became Luther's right-hand man, and in some ways had more importance for the development of Lutheranism than did Luther himself. And that's, I know, quite a statement, because without Luther, there would not have been Lutheranism. Um, and yet, still, in terms of how Luther's movement developed later on, especially after Luther's death, um, this figure w was central. And that figure was uh, by the name of Philip Melanchthon. And I think I've already addressed Melanchthon a bit uh, in previous lectures, talking about humanism. So this is going to be somewhat brief in reminding you of that lecture on humanism and reform uh, when I talked about Melanchthon um, and how he changed his name to the Greek form. It was Philip Schwartz erred in German and he changed it, making it Greek to Melanchthon, uh, the Black Earth. And so, but really it was a, a, a big event for, for Luther, also in the context of Reformation as university curriculum reformation, reformation of the university curriculum bringing in humanism. And Luther was all for that. And Wittenberg hired um, or sought to appoint a new professor of Greek, which was not part of the scholastic um, university curriculum at all. So this is a new kind of departure. Let's bring in someone who, who can teach Greek. I think I mentioned that they wanted to get Johannes Reuchlin, who was a very famous uh, German humanist. And Reuchlin was too old and said, no, I'm not going to do that. But hey, my nephew... Um, Philip Schwarz there is brilliant, and so he's young. Um, he's 21. I mean, he was born in 1497. And why don't you hire him? And that's what they did, Melanchthon. So Melanchthon comes to Wittenberg in 1518 um, as the new professor of Greek and gives his inaugural address, which has the title on the Reform of Studies, in which he argued for uh, a humanism uh, to be part of the curriculum to focus on classical Latin, Greek, and then Hebrew. And Luther was blown away by it. Uh, and Luther said, okay, Philip, this is great. We can work together on this. And what I want you to do too, now keep in mind, 1518, the indulgences controversy was beginning to make waves. Um, and so he said, I want you to start studying theology because Melanchthon did not study theology. He had studied, um, you know, the arts, the liberal arts in, in Heidelberg and then in Tübingen. Um, and he said, I want you to start studying for theology. So in 1521, just three years later, uh, Melanchthon received his bachelor's of arts degree in theology with his theses he put forward. And also in 1521, he published the first edition of what was to become a most important work uh, for the Reformation, uh, at least for the Lutheran Reformation, namely his Loci Communes, which translates as common places or general themes. There's a whole background behind the term Loci Communes. Um, there's been a lot of discussion on it, usually not really... Um, as informed about what it all meant uh, as it should have been, because it's, it gets into Aristotelian logic and, and rhetoric, um, and it's kind of fusing different areas and commonplaces. We think of today as commonplaces as something that everybody knows. And in some ways, what it, it was doing is saying, here are the essential themes or topics or places of a given dis discipline. And Melanchthon did that. Melanchthon systematized theology. Luther was not a systematician. He was not a systematic theologian at all, but he recognized the value of it. Now, Luther, uh, Melanchthon's Lucky Communes went through a number of editions up until 1559, so it's still he continued to revise it and expand it, <coughs> whereby the 1521 edition uh, is I won't say very, but it's somewhat rudimentary, rudimentary uh, compared to the 1559 edition. Keep in mind, Luther, too, said uh, in his preface to his Opera Omnia, which he talked about his great breakthrough, he said, I wish everybody, my writings would have all been burned, with the exception of De Servio Arbitrio, on the, on the bondage of the will, and my small catechism. He says, because there are better works out there, such as, you know, Philip's Loci Communes. That's the estimation that Luther gave to this work. And Melanchthon first publishes it in 1521. As after he had only been studying theology for three years. Now, Melanchthon went on not only to support Luther, but also to, indeed, uh, revise and transform the curriculum at, at Wittenberg. He began, began writing textbooks for Wittenberg on the liberal arts. <coughs> he writes a book on physics. He writes a, uh, several treatises on ethics, and he keeps revising these, too. There's a couple of editions of this physics. Um, he writes a book on um, a, a Greek grammar. He writes a Latin grammar. 
And so in some ways, in the local community in some ways too, is, is a textbook. He became known as the teacher of Germany, the Praecaptor Germaniae, uh, because he provided the textbooks that actually continued in use uh, in Germany until the 18th century. So it's a, a major impact in terms of who he was and what he did, uh, and it, it's fascinating. Uh, and also we begin to see this transformation, humanist transformation, that other scholars, um, Anthony Grafton and Lisa Jardine talks about you know, from humanism to the humanities, a real transformation of education from lecturing on individual texts to courses in subjects. I think I, I said that, you know, at the universities, um, you would hear lectures on texts of Aristotle or texts of the Bible or texts of Peter Lombard's sentences. It was very focused on a, a given text. Melanchthon certainly knew Aristotle very well and was pushing for a new translation of Aristotle. Um, but he devised these textbooks that are focused on the subject. Even if he's using Aristotle, especially for his dialectic, his what we call, um, or logic, because there's another textbook on, on logic or dialectic, which also went through numerous editions, um, and rhetoric as well. But he's talking about the subject itself. And so he's part of this transformation, again, using the phrase, not mine, but Anthony Grafton and Lisa Jardines, uh, of the transformation from humanism to the humanities, from education being focused on individual texts to being focused on subjects. And that is what he provided Wittenberg students with, and indeed uh, most of the universities within the empire eventually. And it all kind of begins, it starts with Melanchthon, even though there's still a lot of humanist interest other places. I think the first um, humanist allowed to lecture on poetry was actually at Heidelberg uh, in the later 15th century. But with Melanchthon, it becomes really institutionalized. And Frederick the Wise sees this as a good thing because this was his university. And Luther is making uh, it famous, and now Melanchthon is doing things that also are making a reputation for Wittenberg. And in so many ways, we need to see not Luther, but Frederick the Wise as the true father of the Reformation. And this brings me back to where we left off the last lecture with Luther at the Var Vartborg. And here we see, yeah, the first thing, Frederick the Wise is the father of the Reformation, because when we realize what would have happened to Luther at Worms, when Charles V says, okay, I will, uh, I will honor my safe conduct, you may leave Worms, but thereafter the imperial legislature has deemed you condemned and to be captured and handed over to Rome. And Luther thought that was, was exactly what was going to happen. He has escaped being burned as a heretic, which he thought he was going to at, at, at Worms, like uh, he knew had happened to you know, Jan Hus at, at the Council of Constance. Charles, at least, I'm Charles, I, I really feel for Charles V. Um, in, in so many ways, in my view, and I'll be talking about this a bit, a bit later, too, in this lecture, he was the last Christian emperor. No, he was not the last, no, excuse me, the last Christian medieval emperor. Um, he was not the last Christian emperor, but he was the last Christian medieval emperor. He still had this ideal, this knightly ideal of honor and rightness and goodness, and that he, as emperor, was really the head of Christendom. And how to govern all of this in keeping with Christian principles. Charles tried. He wasn't going to renege on his promise. He was going to let Luther go, and then he could be handed over. But Frederick got to him first and whisked him away. And there is confusion at Wittenberg. What had happened to Luther? And they were all afraid that he had been captured and sent to Rome. Now, what was Luther doing at the Wartburg? Well, you can still go visit the Wartburg and they see you have Luther's room. And um, Luther was sitting there and he was in hiding, and so it's like, well, i got to do something with my time, so I'm going to start translating the Bible into German. Now, I'm going to talk about next week, when we talk about printing and everything, the extent to which Luther's translation uh, was not all that it was has often been made out to be. Um, number one, this principle of sola scriptura, 
um, that is seen as one of the hallmarks of the Reformation, uh, together with sola gratia and sola fide, um, is not really what it's often taken to be. Luther meant uh, sola scriptura, meaning if we base a theological argument, it should be based on scripture alone. He doesn't mean that all you need to do is read scripture. Because the problem with reading scripture is getting it right and interpreting it correctly. That was what the issue was at at, at, at Worms, which I think I said, you know, the, the scope of scripture, that main point, which is a humanist concept. Luther was not a humanist himself, but he he adopted and used humanist principles and, and, and ideas. <laughs> Um, especially the focus on, uh, well, no, we'll get there later. Um, and so that idea was he had discovered the key to opening up the scriptures. And that's how he describes it in his 1545 preface with his discovery of passive righteousness. He said it opened all the scriptures to him. So he wanted to translate that. But what does he do? He gets rid of what he calls the medieval glosses, which we, we're now be talking we'll get more about this uh, next week. Um, but he replaces the medieval glosses with his own glosses. He's certainly saying, telling uh, the readers, this is how you should understand this passage. And so and so it's not, and he also then when it's, when it's published, includes images, um, very provocative images, uh, polemical images uh, against the Pope and so. Uh, and so it was by no means, quote unquote, scripture alone, but we'll come back to that issue. But he's trying to provide a, a good German translation that everybody can read as long as they read it and understand it as he instructs. And it's in this context, partly, that then um, he then called back to Wittenberg. I mean, Wittenberg became aware of his uh, whereabouts not that long after he had been whisked away to the Wartburg, uh, you know, with Frederick the Wise having orchestrated it all and Georg Spalatin, whom I talked about before, uh, the kind of Secretary of State, um, being fairly close with the Wittenbergers. And so he, they let them know that Frederick had protected Luther. And Luther, as he's translating, he's trying to bring um, a, a live translation. Now, there had been German translations before into low German, whatever, but Luther says, I'm going to do something different. I'm going to translate it into you know a good language that people you know, are living. So he would write back to Melanchthon and his other colleagues at Wittenberg and say, you know, how do you really translate this? Also really interesting. Uh, had usually often been assumed that Luther was uh, translating directly from the Greek, using Erasmus's new Greek New Testament, uh, Novum Instrumentum, and so, um, for his September Testament that came out in 1522, for Luther's own September Testament that came out in 1522, starting with the New Testament. But another scholar, even back in the, I think it was the early 60s, I believe I have to check except exactly when this book was published, Luther's translator, we really argued that for the most part, Luther was translating from the Vulgate. Yes, he would look at the Greek, but he was really focused on the on the Latin, the Vulgate. But his translation ended up setting the German language. Um, if you've studied German today in, in school, in high school, or, or here at IUPUI or whatever, um, you're studying what's called High German. Um, and Luther really set that standard of what the standardized German would be, because language is all different and very local and regional. And there had been region, some, a couple few regional translations, so to speak, in German. But Luther said, I'm going to make a translation that will be good for all people who can read German. And that's what, it was quite an accomplishment. And that's what he, he really did. And that's where he, he starts that process in the Wartburg. Um, and then he's writing back to his colleagues in Wittenberg saying, help me with this. Well, it's really a team effort. And that's when we talk about the Wittenberg theology, not just the translation, even though it's Luther, but still there was, he was asking for help. But as it had been all along, at least in Luther's mind, this was a project of the, the theological faculty at Wittenberg. This was a university issue. This was, you know, yes, he was kind of the lead of it, but it was the Wittenberg team that was all involved. And that really caused problems with Luther being stuck in the Wartburg. But then who was the leader of what was going on at Wittenberg? Who was going to take the reins with Luther being gone and out, out of it, even if they knew where he was now and everything else? And Melanchthon is still pretty young, keep in mind. Uh, he's in his you know, mid-20s by this point. Um, and he didn't really feel, even though he was recent, <laughs> a recent... Um, Master, uh, Bachelor of Theology, that he didn't really have the the status, the gravitas to lead what was going on at Wittenberg, even though he was close with Luther, it's still developing. And another 
colleague, Andreas Bodenstein von Karlstadt, really felt that he should assume the leadership of the Wittenberg movement uh, with Luther being gone. Now, Karlstadt um, had been actually the, the senior uh, senior colleague of Luther's and had actually granted and conferred the, the uh, Doctor of Theology degree on Luther um, and had a conversion experience himself, which I'll be talking about shortly. Um, and he started to institute changes in Wittenberg um, that Luther saw as being really radical. He issued a number of ordinances that he got the city council to, to pass. He got rid of images. Um, he started to, uh, he celebrated the first evangelical mass on Christmas uh, in 1521. He said, okay, you know, we're going to really do this. <laughs> we're going to really do this. And when Luther heard of what was going on, especially the uh, iconoclastic outbreaks of destroying images and trying to get rid of things uh, in churches. Luther said, no, 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 no. And that prompted Luther's return to the Wartburg, or to, to Wittenberg. Because even though Luther realized he was in danger, he thought, this can't go on. I need to go back to Wittenberg to set things straight. And he does that in March of 1522 and preaches a series of eight sermons called the Invocavit Sermons, because they began, I think it was on, on March 8th. Um, and it was called Invocavi uh, Sunday, in which he kind of says, we have to slow down. And he chastises uh, Karlstadt for having gone too, too quickly. And he says, you know what? Even if these changes are legitimate and even good in one sense, you're forcing them. And then having the city council pass laws to instill them, that is turning the gospel, the freedom of the gospel into law. And that is the cardinal sin for Luther. And so he says, we have to stop this. We have to stop this. And in so many ways, Karl Stett was humiliated. Um, and I'll be talking about him in a second a bit more. Uh, but the point here is that this was not just Luther. This was a whole team of what was going on in Wittenberg. Uh, Christopher Sherrill was a, a lawyer in, in Wittenberg and one of, became one of Luther's close associates. And then Melanchthon, of course, and then Karlstadt early on had been, it became one of his most ardent advocates who even went far beyond Luther. Um, so there's all kinds of, of developments at Wittenberg as Luther's in the Wartburg and then with his return. Um, and we'll see then, well, why didn't Luther, why wasn't Luther just captured then? Well, number one, he's traveling through Frederick the Wise's territory. He's going from one Frederick the Wise castle in the Bartburg back to Wittenberg, which is definitely within the territory of Frederick the Wise. So he has Frederick the Wise's protection. He had to be careful where he would travel to. Um, he was, quote, unquote, relatively safe traveling within Frederick's lands, but he couldn't really travel somewhere else. Now, anyway, that's, gets into other issues. But that's what kind of what, what was going on in Wittenberg while uh, Luther was at the Wartburg. But here I want to come back and focus a bit more on Karlstadt, um, just a little bit more because I already, already talked a fair amount of it. But there were tensions there with uh, between Luther early on. And here I have, you know, the old guard radicalized Andreas Bodenschein from Karlstadt. Um, because as I said, he was really part, of, Karl Stott was really part of the, the, the old guard at Wittenberg. Um, he was um, yeah, already established there, even though it's still a new university. Um, and he just thought at first that Luther represented this almost newfangled approach. I mean, this gets into university politics. I'm not sure if I mentioned this before in terms of the Via Moderna, the Via Antiqua. I think I did a little bit. Um, and Karlstadt was, uh, was a member of the Via Antiqua at Wittenberg, whereas Luther then came in as part of the Via Moderna. Um, so there's those tensions as well. And at a public disputation in 1516 for one of Luther's students, Bartholomew Feldkirchen, um, and Bartholomew was you know, defending theses that had been written by Luther. Um, and one of those, in the course of that, that disputation, he made the statement that um, the, the treatise on true and false pen, penitence was not by Augustine. Um, it had been often, not always, but often attributed to Augustine. That's one of the uh, interesting things about the reception of Augustine in the Middle Ages. What we today know um, are, were works that were not written by Augustine, 
circulated as works of Augustine. And today we refer to them as pseudo-Augustinian works, works that circulated under the name of Augustine, but had not, were not by Augustine. And that gets into all kinds of issues, and also in terms of authorship, who created these? Were they trying to get away with something, or was it just tradition? Here's a, a treatise that we're not really sure who wrote it, but it sure, sure sounds like Augustine, so we're going to just say Augustine wrote it, and then that gets passed along. It's, it's a fascinating study in terms of that textual reception. But true, on true and false penitence, it was one of those treatises that had been ascribed to Augustine. And Bartholomew of Feldkirchen, based on Luther's tutelage, had said, you know, no, that's, that's not Augustine. You can't appeal to the authority of Augustine based on this treatise because Augustine never read it. And Karlstadt stood up and objected. Said, it is to Augustine. How can you say it's not? You know, you're just wrong. And Luther then came to his student's defense and said, no brother, Andrew, you're wrong. You haven't read it, have you? You haven't read Augustine, have you? Why don't you go read it and figure it out before you make such an ass of yourself in public? That's me paraphrasing. We don't know what Luther actually said. What we do know is that Karlstadt, having been rebuked publicly by Luther at that disputation with regarding to the treatise on true and false penitence, at least had the, the integrity to say, hmm, and went out and purchased Augustine's Opera Omnia, which was being uh, published and just being published um, early on at the Frankfurt Book Fair. Now, Luther had a at least one volume uh, of that new Opera Omnia of Augustine, volume eight, which dealt with the anti uh, Pelagian treatises. Karl shot by the whole thing. He read it, thoroughly studied it, and thought, oh my God, Luther is right. And he. Carl Schott was so impressed with the, uh, on the spirit in the letter, the spirit to it litera, uh, which was an authentic work of Augustine's, that he said, I'm going to issue a new commentary on the de spirit to it litera. And he does so. He publishes a new commentary, and that gets into the whole debate about Luther, Luther's statement in 1545. Uh, I told you about He said he, he went back to Augustine against hope, um, blah, blah, blah. I've already talked about that, I believe, in previous lectures. But that radicalized Karlstadt, maybe perhaps because of his sense of, I was humiliated and wrong, oh my God, now I'm right, and I'm also right, I see that Luther isn't going far enough. He started referring to, to, to Luther as Dr. Pussyfoot, um, as someone who wasn't really going the whole way, really seeing the impact of what he had actually even started. And that's why when Luther is off at the whiteboard, Karlstadt all of a sudden says, Ha! Huh, I can take this leak, and that's when he, uh, you know, announces that he is going to to get rid of the mass. Luther didn't get, hadn't gotten rid of the mass, but Karl Schott wanted to get rid of the mass, and we have the first evangelical mass or celebration on Christmas. And I will give uh, celebrate communion, giving the body and blood, the bread and the wine, to everybody, which was a shocking thing. Because like, wait, really? And Karl Schett does that, and not only does he do that, he doesn't come in his priestly vestments. He comes to celebrate it simply in a, in a robe. And he started referring to himself as Brother Andrew. Now, that was just too much for Luther. That, combined with the iconoclasm that was going on under Karl Stott's instigations and the city council passing laws to institute the, these changes, that brought Luther back and Luther, in these eight sermons, the Edmilcavit sermons in March of 1522, just nailed Karlstadt, not necessarily by name, but what was going on, and rebuked what was going on. And that, once again, humiliated Karlstadt. So much so that he ended up leaving Wittenberg. Brother Andrew left when he ended up in a little town called Orlamunde, becoming the pastor of Orlamunde. And Karlstadt really became one of the founding fathers, if not the founding fathers, of what ended up becoming the, the, the Baptist movement. I'll be talking about the Radical Reformation, so to speak, um, next week, or also then later on, I think, as well, a little bit. Um, but it was this issue of, okay, Luther, you were right, but you don't go far enough. We need to do a lot more, and we need to get rid of all you know, priestly vestments, vestments, and we are just going to have this communal issue, and also then the whole baptism issue, which will be uh, was very important. I'll be talking a lot more about that later on, uh, not today, but in later lectures. So that is part of it. And Luther, you know, worried about this. And um, 
he didn't really know what to do. So we have this situation in Wittenberg where there is controversy, there is you know this and that. Luther is now out of hiding, he's come back, and that and he still is publishing, and that means too everyone else within the empire knows he was not no longer being hidden and protected by Frederick, even though he's being protected by Frederick within Frederick's own lands. So the question then becomes, why didn't Charles V then at that point move against Luther to put an end to the whole problem and controversy? Well, Charles didn't have the opportunity to. And that's one of the interesting things about the Reformation, is that could it have taken hold if the political situation within Europe was a bit different? If Charles, or in, or if Charles had been uh, had given more attention to it, or it's thought that this is more important than my wars with Francis or my trying to deal with uh, with Spain because he's still king of Spain. There's a lot of opposition to him there. So it's he's trying to manage and administer his the, the empire as a Christian emperor. And that too was causing Charles anguish. Why? Because he had these series of wars with Francis I. Uh, the Valois king of France, who was also very, he was young. Um, Charles II was young, and they kind of clash. And I often refer to Francis I as the first early modern monarch. And we'll see why as we go through it. But Charles had to deal with a, a series of wars with the, the Habsburg Valois wars, including. Uh, the sack of Rome in 1527. Now, why is that a big deal? The sack of Rome in 1527 was actually the sack of Rome by Charles's own troops. And why? Because the Pope was supporting Francis against Charles. Keep in mind that the Pope did not want Charles to be elected. He did not want another Habsburg emperor. He thought we should get rid of him. We really can't. He had approached, you know, for, Francis I to maybe run for emperor, but he realized that the German electors would never go for him, um, nor for Henry VIII, whom also he had approached. And Charles was elected in some ways, you know, despite the Pope's attempts to prevent that election from happening. And so the Pope politically is like, I'm still going to stand against Charles because Charles has too much power. So this political system, when France and Charles are fighting, I'm going to support France. And the issue was over northern Italy. Same problem going back to Pope John the Twenty Second and Louis of Bavaria, those problematic northern Italian cities. What ended up being called the Matilda, uh, Matildine lands after Queen Matilda in, in England back in the twelfth century. And in some ways, it's like, are they part of the Kingdom of France because southern France is really close, or are they part of the Empire? And they kind of go a bit go back and forth. And Charles said, no, they're part of the Empire. And Fred and Francis the First says, no, they're part. Of so there was war breaking out over. Northern Italy, essentially. And the Pope is saying, you know, Charles. And so Charles sent his troops to Rome to deal with the Pope. Now, that is also right when uh, a delegation to the Pope arrived from England with a request from the Pope, namely to um, proclaim Henry VIII's marriage to Catherine of Aragon uh, to be annulled because darn it, Henry wanted an heir and he needed an heir and wanted to get rid of Catherine. Um, but that wasn't going to happen because Charles V, um, when I always get this mixed up, if it's his um, aunt, I think it says aunt, that he was the, the nephew, the grand nephew of Catherine of Aragon. Um, it was a dynastic ploy. We marry uh, a, a Spanish princess, Catherine of Aragon, who was part of the Habsburg, uh, Spanish Habsburg line, to Henry VIII, and their heir would be then heir to the throne of England and Spain, and also the, with all the imperial lands, the family would control all of that. And that's what the Pope wanted to prevent. Number one. Number two, um, Charles was not going to allow the Pope to grant Henry VIII's annulment or divorce. I mean, divorce is not allowed, but annulment is... <laughs> And, but that will get into other issues. But it was not because of Catholic moral theology. That was the last consideration the Pope had. But when you have imperial troops, when you're in hiding in Castello San Angelo because Rome was being sacked by the emperor, um, you're not going to requ uh, grant a request that goes counter to the emperor's you know, explicit dynastic plans. Uh, 
So Charles is really strategizing with all of this and how to deal with it. So when you have all these issues in terms of international politics, Charles was really in a dilemma and couldn't really focus on Luther. He couldn't say, okay, we're going to go in and deal with Frederick, who's protecting him. He said, well, Frederick, you need to hand him over. We can't deal with that because I'm dealing with you know fighting the French, which gave the space for Luther's movement to develop and for the Reformation to spread. Now, at the time, it was called the Evangelical Movement. I think I've already addressed that term, too. Um, not evangelical as we think of it today, or as the term is used today, but evangelical as based on the preaching of the pure gospel. Gospel in, in Latin is evangelium. Um, and the, it's the good news, the good news uh, uh, of Jesus Christ presented in the Gospels. So that's what it's all about. And we're going to have preaching based on the Gospels, based on the Scripture, um, and focus on the Scripture. And that is going to be kind of the basis of this movement that is going to be, and we refer to ourselves as the evan uh, evangelicals. We're going to establish preaching. And that was convincing. And among Luther's earliest supporters were not only Frederick the Wise, and it's like, well, did Frederick the Wise support Luther because he uh, believed everything that Luther was saying and wanted the pure preaching of the gospel? Well, partly, but maybe not completely. There's also that political dynamic of this is my guide. He's made my university famous. This is good for me politically. Um, you know, Frederick had one of the largest relic collections in Europe and gained a lot of money from people coming on pilgrimage to view his relics. So when Luther even was saying, well, relics aren't really, you know, indulgences, Frederick was like, oh, yeah, but, 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 um, he had to work on that. But Frederick protected Luther. Now, in addition to some other princes, and there were Philip of Hesse, um, was, became a big supporter of Luther. There's a couple other important German princes, but then also, and primarily, and especially, I shouldn't say primarily, but especially then, Imperial cities. Now, these imperial cities were cities, as I think I've talked about um, early on, that were called free imperial cities. They had received a charter from the emperor early on to be uh, outside the structure of the, the, the feudal structure. So they were def uh, directly underneath the emperor. And they could govern themselves. And that's what they were doing. And they started to say, oh, with this, what's going on with Luther and all of this, we are going to establish preacherships, civic preacherships, whereby we will hire a pastor to come in, and preferably someone trained at Wittenberg by Luther, to be the pastor for the city, the main pastor, because usually cities are big enough, they don't have just one parish, they have several, but we'll have the main pastor, who will then also help model and instruct the other priests and this passion we base on the pure preaching of the gospel now i'm leaving aside what the what constitutes the pure preaching of the gospel but that was the the idea that was put out there that was you know advocated the slogan almost the pure preaching of the gospel so we have city councils who are governing themselves making decisions appointing civic pastors in support of this new evangelical movement that had started at Wittenberg. And the movement is spreading. Now, the problem here is that these free imperial cities were subjects of the emperor, just as was Luther and Frederick the Wise. There's opposition then to the emperor. And that includes then developments not only in these imperial cities, especially in southwest Germany, but also in what we call the Swiss. Um, the, and we have, especially we see that with Zwingli, Ulrich Zwingli in Zurich, <coughs> who begins to um, institute reform his, himself in Zurich. Uh, he claimed that he did so independently of Luther. Um, but it's a little bit later than Luther. There's a couple of disputations, but he, get, he gets um, the Zurich City Council to um, pass ordinances, much like Karlstadt had done, and Zwingli becomes the leader of what later would be referred to as the Reformed tradition, um, and is important for the background to Calvin, because these imperial cities and Swiss cities, because Swiss were free cities too, um, 
has a whole kind of different model of what the Reformation was all about. In fact, uh, Stephen Osmond, who is um, a great scholar, he's retired now, but he's from was at Harvard, first at Yale, first at Harvard. He actually had studied when he was pretty young with the, the same person I had studied with, um, Michael Obermann. And one of his uh, early books, which is uh, kind of the last really decent book he wrote, then he kind of goes off and writes a lot of you know fun stories and stuff, which is great, but it's not really like. Anyway, that's another issue. Um, it was called the Reformation of the Cities. A German scholar, Bernd Muller, wrote the Imperial Cities and Reformation, uh, Reformation Reichstag and Re Reformation, um, and they put forward this thesis of the, the the cities, this idea of the free cities, seized upon Luther's understanding of the freedom of a Christian, which I'll come back to. We'll see in the next lecture um, the problems of the misinterpretation of that, at least for Luther and start developing their own opposition to Rome. Also based on this concept of Rome had been fleecing us Germans all along. It's one of the Swiss, maybe not quite the same as the Germans, but basically they were, um, at least in the context of the part of the empire. We have to stand against this Italian attempt to tell us what to do, basically. We are free imperial cities. And we don't even have to listen to the emperor because we can govern ourselves and make our own decisions. And we're deciding to uh, to institute reforms along the lines of, of Luther and the evangelical ideas. Now, Zwingli will become very important for us uh, later on, too. I think it's not next week, but the week after when I talk about the developments from um, Forms to Augsburg. Um, because on the, in so many ways, Zwingli and Luther had very similar views with a few major exceptions, especially regarding the Eucharist. And I'll be talking about that and the Marburg Colloquy in 1529 um, between Luther and, and Zwingli. It was a big to-do. and It was the basis for presenting a united Protestant front at this time. And again, before 1529, actually, there's no such thing as the Protestants. We have the Evangelicals. I'll be talking about the emergence of the Protestants later, I guess in a couple of weeks. But here's like, but by, by, by the Marburg Colloquy of 1529, they were Protestants. They were basically protesting against the imperial legislature. And the idea was we need to present a united front. We need to get Zwingli, the leader of the Swiss, what was going on in Switzerland, in the Swiss cities, and consequently kind of with the imperial cities following along, together with what Luther is saying. And they agreed about almost everything except the Eucharist. Now, I'll be talking about that later. Uh, again, when we get there in, in the next week's lectures, but the week thereafter. So that's why Zwingli will become very important. He ended up dying on the Battle of Koppel in 1531, but we'll come back to that as well. So we have this whole beginning of the spread and I won't say institutionalization, but it's really taking hold this evangelical movement. It is being, you know, it is growing and growing in ways that Luther didn't foresee. Um, Luther referred to Singley later on and a lot of anybody else who did not agree with him as part of his false brethren. You kind of see the light, but then they go off in their own direction and turn the gospel into a new law. That was Luther's big problem. We don't turn the gospel into law. And yet, even though there are internal divisions and Luther can, you know, complain about his 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 uh, false brethren and with Zwingli and some of the Swiss the Schwärmer, as he called them, those people who are just kind of crazy and out of it. Still, over against Rome and over against the emperor, there was this emerging evangelical front that, you know, it's not just Luther anymore. It's not just a single German Augustinian hermit. It is other German princes, several other German cities who are in open opposition to imperial policy, who are refusing to uphold and institute the Edict of Worms, that Luther should be captured, handed over to uh, Rome to be tried for 
heresy and that his writings should be confiscated and burned. That was the Edict of Worms, whereby we talk about the growth and spread of the Reformation and the introduction of the Reformation becomes based on whether or not a prince or a city would enforce the Edict of Worms. That was the key, which was an imperial decree. Because Charles was dealing with France and was dealing with his problems with Spain, fighting wars and everything, he had this problem. He couldn't, he didn't have the leisure, he didn't have the space to put an end to this. And consequently, there was space for the evangelical movement to grow to a sufficient position and strength that it was not so easy to get rid of. In some ways, it's almost analogous, going all the way back, which I don't think I did talk about this in this course. I always talk about this in my Western Civ courses or early medieval courses, to um, to uh, you know, the third century um, on into the early fourth century in Rome, with Diocletian's attempt to once and for all rid the world of Christians, and he issues the Great Persecution in three hundred three, um, and he thinks he's finally going to to get rid of them. Uh, there had been, you know, sporadic persecutions before, but Diocletian, who comes to the, uh, becomes emperor in 285, has all kinds of, you know, administrative developments, which are, you know, Diocletian has gotten a bad press so much because of this attempt to get rid of all the Christians. But it's like, you know, I'm going to finally want to do it. But by then, by the, you know, by the, the end of the third, beginning of the fourth century, Christianity had grown and developed to a point where it wasn't easy to have gotten rid of. If, he, if, you know, an earlier emperor in the year 150 said, we're going to get rid of all the Christians, they could have. They didn't. A few persecutions, what, you know, and, and, you know, burning Christians or having, throwing them to the, you know, into the, the amphitheater wasn't sufficient to stop the movement. And by 300, it had gotten big enough. It's been estimated probably approximately 10% anyway of the population was Christians. That they couldn't stop it, even though they tried. And in some ways, that's an analogous situation to what Charles was facing. If Charles had immediately after Worms said, and we're going to stop this, I'm going to send imperial troops immediately to get Luther as soon as he steps out of the, you know, steps across the city walls of Worms, we're going to get him, we're going to hand him over to the emperor, or to the pope, over and done with. But that didn't happen. Charles didn't have the space to do that. He was at Worms, makes his decree, signs the decree, and he has to go deal with you know, international politics of the, as the emperor, leaving it to others to take care of. Could he have gotten rid of Luther and the evangelical movement? Oh yeah, he could have if he had done, you know, jumped on it. But that space allowed it to develop and to grow to the point where when Charles finally did have the opportunity to try to focus on it, um, it had already gotten too big. Now, that is a story we'll talk about in a couple weeks. Uh, and we'll see why and what was going on, developments between, let's say, you know, Luther of Wartburg in 1521 until you know the, the deed of Augsburg in 1530. Because um, there's a lot of developments. But this emerging Protestant front, or well, I shouldn't say Protestant, this emerging evangelical front is against the emperor and against the pope. And I have up there, the Reformation takes hold, and that's really what I'm meaning by this, is that Luther's movement, what started out with Luther's movement, becomes a political movement very early on. From the moment that Frederick the Wise determines, I'm not going to allow Luther to be captured. Why? For personal self-interest. He's made my university famous. Individual belief, maybe, partly, somewhat. But standing up against the imperial decree, that, that decision by Frederick to kidnap Luther, to not allow him to be handed over to Rome, was a pretty gutsy move. He's going against the decree of the imperial legislature, the Reichstag. Now, yes, he was one of the major princes. He's the elector of, of Saxony. He had the standing to do that. But it's still, it's, it was, uh, it, it was something. So when I say that, you know, and call Frederick the father of the Reformation, 
just imagine what would have happened if Frederick had not been in, in support of Luther for whatever reasons he may have had to do so. So did Luther bring it all about or was it the political situation? Was Luther aware of the political situation? Uh, yeah, but that wasn't his focus. It became something that he had to deal with, and he did. And we'll talk more about that as we go along. But what had begun as his own campaign against, first of all, his own personal journey of trying to understand, you know, the scriptures as a, as a, as a prof, you know, professor of the Bible and as a, the pastor of the Wittenberg Church, then his discovery of passive righteousness, which was for him everything, and then his dealing with the pastoral issue of indulgences to all of a sudden now this is a political movement much greater than the theological issues involved and it became that very early on in some ways when luther was whisked off to the vartborg under the leadership of karlstadt in wittenberg it became a political movement when karlstadt gets the city council to pass the the, the city new city ordinances and we go from there. Major issue. And so when I asked the question or posed the question, was the Reformation a political event or a theological event? It was like both. Which was first? Which was second? Can we really under, you know, interpret it without the other? And the problem has been that so often it has been interpreted as a theological movement within a broader political context. And yes, but it becomes so fused that it's difficult to distinguish the two. And we'll see that as we go along, and even when we then finally get to the, the origins of Protestants, which were actually cities and princes, a group of cities and princes, that protested the decree of the Dean of Speyer in 1529, that the Edict of Worms must be enforced. They said, no, we protest, and they left the Diet. And this then was the, 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 the beginning of the coming of civil war within the empire. Because Charles said, this really cannot be. We cannot allow open protest. But this period between, let's say, 1521 and, and 1529 was a period that the movement was growing and establishing itself. Political, religio-political unity. Not that it was unified in doctrine so much as Luther's false brethren demonstrated, at least for Luther's mind. But it, it gets to be, let's say, a real mess. You know, that's not a scholarly term, a real mess. I don't want you writing that out, what you're writing, uh, as you're answering text analysis too with the address of the Christian nobility to say, yeah, yeah and it all became a, a real mess. Um, but in terms of just grasping and understanding, that, that's what it was developing into, a real mess a political, theological, religious controversy and problematic. How do we deal with all of this? As we'll see, too, as we go further, once you throw off Rome, once you throw off you know, the authority structure, the political structure of, of, of Christendom, what do you replace it with? That was a big issue. It was a big issue for the Swiss cities. As we'll see, big issue for German princes. How do we do this? And what's our relationship to the emperor? How does this all work together? And Christendom, it's like, is beginning to, have been beginning for quite a while, really break asunder this concept of the emperor leading a unified Christendom or the pope leading a unified Christendom, depending on whom you ask. So that's where we're going with this. And next week we'll see um, further how this development developed, so to speak, um, including issues with the uh, the increasing radicalization of some factions uh, among Luther's false brethren, as we'll see, but also uh, an event uh, that, that the followers of the Pope and Charles and the evangelical cities and princes all uh, 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 suppressed, namely uh, a series of events that's referred to as the German Peasants War of 1525. That's where we're going with this. Okay. Thank you so much, and we will continue next week.
Bye-bye.